This is the Positive Psychology Podcast, episode 41. Welcome to the Positive Psychology Podcast, bringing your earbuds the science of the good life. And now, your host, Kristen Trumpy. Okay, today Ryan Nemec is returning to the show. He is a psychologist, coach, author, and he works for the VIA Institute on Character. His latest book is Mindfulness and Character Strengths, A Practical Guide to Flourishing. Today, we will discuss mindfulness. Thanks for returning to the podcast, Ryan. Yes, well, thanks for having me, Kristen. This is always a lot of fun with you. Thank you, thank you. So lots of people have probably heard of mindfulness, but could you define it for us? Sure, yeah, and that actually is a, can be a fairly complicated question. I'll try to make it um, you know, try to as understandable as possible. But it's a, a little complicated because mindfulness has become so popular in the world today, and it's popular across countries, it's popular from a research perspective, from a practice perspective, it's even in the common lingo in many, many countries. And so then, and that's wonderful in some ways, but then in other ways it can be uh, damaging a bit for the study of mindfulness uh, because then everybody is defining mindfulness a little bit differently. So if you ask uh, the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama will define it in one way and then a scientist will define it in another way, Thich Nhat Hanh defines it in another way, John Kabat-Zinn and so on. And then what are we really studying if we're all defining it in different ways? And so researchers realized this in the early 2000s and so they, many different researchers gathered, it was around 20 or so, mindfulness scientists, and they scoured the research on mindfulness and the traditional work on mindfulness and uh, what people were saying on a practice and research level. And they really, the intention was to come up with an operational definition. So a consensual definition that everybody could go by so that we know what it is that we're studying with when, when people talk about mindfulness. And um, so I'll go ahead and tell you that definition. It's actually a two-part definition that they came up with. And uh, it goes like this, that mindfulness is the self-regulation of our attention, is part one, with an attitude of curiosity, openness, and acceptance. I'll just say a little bit about each of those. So this first part, self-regulation of attention. So that means that if a person is practicing mindfulness in some way, they're taking control of their attention and they're placing it somewhere, you know, with their control. So they're self-regulating it. They're, maybe they're putting their attention on uh, their loved one's face as they're talking to them. Or maybe they're putting their attention on their breathing. Or maybe they're putting it on a beautiful forest landscape. Or maybe they're putting it on one of their problems, you know, but they're taking control of the attention in some way. And then the second part of the mindfulness definition that the researchers came up with is that when you're putting your attention on that thing, what is your approach to it? Well, it's to be open to what's going on there. It's to be curious about it and to be accepting. And so those are actually literally their exact words in, this, in the scientific article. And I think it's nice because it's very practical and, and easy to understand when it's kind of broken down that way. So we're being open to what's going on in the present moment. Uh, we're being curious about it, kind of wanting to explore it, wanting to understand what's going on with what we're putting our attention on. And then finally, we're being accepting of it. We're accepting that this is how things are in this particular present moment. Not that five seconds later it's not going to be different, not that it's, it's permanent in the present moment, but just in this exact second with what I'm put, putting my attention on, I can accept that. I can bring an acceptance attitude to that. So that's the definition that, uh, that, that many researchers now go by. Okay, thanks for outlining it so clearly. So what are the benefits of mindfulness? Well, there are many benefits that researchers are finding. Um, just to give you a, a little scope of the landscape for on the research in mindfulness, you know, back in uh, in the 1980s, there were a few articles uh, on mindfulness and on the benefits uh, of mindfulness. In the 1990s, there was, you know, maybe you know 40 or 50, and now in 2015. There are literally over 50 new publications every single month on mindfulness. And so that amounts to 
you know, five or six hundred new papers every single year that come out. And so many of these are actually outlining the benefits of mindfulness. So it's really too many to mention. But um, in general, um, it can be broken down into uh, a category of helping people to manage problems and helping people to create greater well-being. You know, and of course, we can break those down into all sorts of different nuances, like managing the uh, people people's problem with recurrent depression or with panic disorder or certain things like that, or just managing conflicts in their relationships. So that's kind of one category is kind of managing problems, you know, you know, working through psychological struggles and so on, physical struggles. And then other category is kind of around expanding one's consciousness, kind of building well-being. And so that's where mindfulness is connected with greater happiness and uh, engagement and uh, things like that. Okay. Now, meditation gets thrown into the mix a lot. And I have this inkling that sometimes people might confuse the two a little bit. So um, what's the difference between mindfulness and meditation or what's the relationship between the two? Yeah, it's a it's a good question, and it's one that that isn't as clear as mindfulness. You know, with mindfulness, I was able to kind of really easily mention the two part definition, and um, with meditation, I mean that word has been thrown around in so many different ways, and there isn't an operational definition to just meditation. So it's a bit more of a generic word. You know, I think of it um, relating to specific practices that people might have, which can build mindfulness. Um, so meditation in some ways can be the more narrow word, you know, so it's, it's that we're going to, to practice a particular meditation where we're going to, to try to build our love within ourselves, or we're going to practice a meditation on our breathing and whenever our mind wanders, we're going to bring it back. Um, you know, and of, and of course, depending on if you uh, ascribe to a particular religious practice, there are meditations talked about in different religious traditions, and those have their own breakdowns. Uh, all the world religions um, use it to want in one way, shape, or another um, to help to kind of people to tap deeper into their um, religious and spiritual experiences. So, it, in that sense, it kind of depends on the audience and who you're who you're asking. But my, you know, medit mindfulness is one type of meditation um, so we're we're trying to practice that aspect of becoming more regulated with our attention and being open and curious about our present moment about our bodies about our mind about our breath um, yeah so that would be w one way to begin to think about that distinction then so when we when we do meditate it's helping us to become more mindful thanks for clarifying that um, just Actually, last week, one of my apprentices, we talked about meditation briefly, and he said, well, it doesn't work for me because I can't empty my mind. And I keep hearing that all the time, so I'm sure you do too. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, so many thoughts, actually, that I, that, that was one of the catalysts for writing a book on on. On this, on this topic, you know, the, as you know, Kristen, it's called mindfulness and character strengths. You know, there's many catalysts for why I wanted to put mindfulness and character strengths together and to, to, to write about it. Um, yeah, so I, people, many people will, will struggle with having some kind of meditation practice or a mindfulness practice, or for that matter, any practice that requires any kind of self-regulation, like maybe a relaxation practice or biofeedback or self-hypnosis. I mean, even like exercising and, you know, eating well. I mean, all these things require self-regulation, cultivating a good habit, using many different character strengths. And, uh, and there's many misconceptions about, about mindfulness and meditation. So people do sometimes think, oh, well, if, I'm, if my mind wanders at all, you know, if it seems like I have lots of thoughts in my mind and I can't get rid of them, then it's just not for me. You know, it's for those other people that practice five hours a day, but, but not for me. I'm too busy for this or it doesn't work. Um, and, and really that is, is just a total misconception that people have. And it's unfortunate because then they don't get to see the fruits and the benefits of, of meditation. So really what I, what I suggest to people is to begin to look, to, to name those things as obstacles that are coming up. So if, if a person says, well, I'm, I don't have time to meditate, which is one of the most common obstacles, uh, or I forgot to meditate, meditate, which is a, a second most common obstacle, 
or the one you mentioned, which would be in the top three, which is that my mind wanders too much or I have too much clutter in my mind. It's another, it's an obstacle. It's something that's getting in the way of that person becoming present to their selves, to their mind, to their loved ones. It's getting in the way of their present moment. But it's, so if we, so if we see it as an obstacle, then that means that we can see that obstacle as an opportunity, as something that we can learn from and, and grow from. Uh, rather than seeing it as something that's a barrier that means it's, it's too w big of a wall that I can't climb over, so it, it's just not for me. So, so we then, I, I then at least, ask people to look at their highest, most core strengths, you know, that we call character strengths or signature strengths. What are those qualities that are best in you? You know, some people are uniquely high in bravery or perseverance or gratitude or kindness or teamwork or prudence or creativity, curiosity, and so on. There's 24 core character strengths. So the idea is what, how can you use your highest strengths to overcome that obstacle or to manage that obstacle? And so that's something that most people in the meditation and mindfulness world don't talk about. And it's a, it brings a whole new dimension to the practice. Suddenly people then are bringing more of who they are into their mindfulness practice. And then they want to do it. If they're really high in gratitude, then, um, and they want to get some kind of mindfulness practice going, then they start their practice with, a, you know, maybe two minutes of gratitude before they spend their time focusing on their breathing. Or they are, maybe they're really high in zest. So maybe the avenue of mindfulness for them is to do walking meditation rather than sitting and following their breath. Um, so it's about kind of each individual kind of working with themselves to meld their best qualities and what they're willing to do with the actual practice. Rather than getting locked into, I've got to sit in a certain way, sit in a certain posture for a certain amount of time, and I've got to do it by following my breath, and that's the only way to do it. But instead, I try to be really flexible with how, they, how uh, people think about this. You know, I love this because for me, it's weird. Like, I had very good experiences with meditation a um, couple of years back. They, it helped me instantly, but then I somehow never ever had the desire to do it again and then but then i kind of figured out that this whole attention regulating mechanism what worked for me was actually through writing you know through trying to become a better writer i would walk around and try to notice things because you can't really generalize especially if you're writing fiction um, you mm. can't generalize you have to characterize characters and i remember back then the world's you know it i felt like i was reborn I, I know this sounds a little bit crazy but it is that that's how I felt you know walking around and suddenly seeing how rich and detailed the world was so I, I didn't really you know connect this to mindfulness or anything until I did my master's in positive psychology but then I thought they always talk about meditation but they're not talking about you know using creativity or using sports is another thing that I feel I'm very focused and very good with my intention when I'm playing soccer and, mm. and I've actually found that these things, they do translate into my real life. So I feel that after, you know, learning some fundamentals about writing, I found that I'm, you know, of course not comparable to some Zen master or someone, but I'm pretty happy with my ability to control my attention. So I'm really happy that you kind of opened that door, which I just felt wasn't there before. Well, it's a really beautiful example, actually a set of beautiful examples that you noted, and you're, and you're really getting at this aspect that we could call mindful living. So it's kind of about bringing that, those same principles, self-regulation of our attention and that attitude of curiosity, openness, acceptance, bringing those, those principles to whatever it is that we're doing. So you're, you're talking about bringing it right into your, into your daily life, whether it's with sport or whether it's with writing or walking in a certain way. And if we're bringing those principles in and we're aware of our body as we're moving and the movement of the pen, aware of our thoughts and we're having all sorts of different thoughts as we're coming up with ideas in the writing process, then we're practicing mindfulness. And that's why mindfulness, we can really kind of demystify it for people because right now people could be, be uh, using mindful listening. So they could be paying close attention to what's being said, kind of really listening clearly, li really being present to what's being said. Or they could be kind of doing somewhat of a mind mindless listening, like some people might be listening right now, but also, um, you know, checking their email and kind of surfing online and only maybe 
20% listening, and so that wouldn't be quite mindful listening. So the idea is that no matter what it is that we're doing, we can, we can bring, it, uh, bring mindfulness to it. Same thing with brushing our teeth. Uh, we can bring mindfulness to that mundane activity. We can bring it to feeding our dog or our cat or a pet. We can bring it to uh, eating lunch, to brewing coffee, you know, to anything. Anything in our life becomes an opportunity to bring mindfulness. And then as you and I were speaking, also we could bring our character strength. We can bring both of them to that everyday experience. So what experiences did you have using mindfulness-based strengths practice with your clients? You know, any differences yeah. compared to, for example, traditional mindfulness training? Did you notice any differences or how is that working out? Yeah, well, it, it seems to be working out really well. Not only just my own personal experiences, which is just, you know, a, a study of one, you know, but, but also the, uh, the experiences of people across different cultures. So when originally putting together the program called Mindfulness-Based Strengths Practice, which is, you know, basically a manualized program that brings mindfulness and character strengths together, um, I had people uh, in various different cultures uh, pilot this eight-week program with, with populations and, and, you know, study it and look at how it worked, you know, in their particular culture with their population and kind of, and then gave me feedback uh, and suggested changes and so on. And that's actually what then informed what's in the, the latter third of the Mindfulness and Character Strengths book. It's a manual for that Mindfulness-Based Strengths Practice program. And what I and those others and, and subsequent people who have been looking at Mindfulness-Based Strengths Practice have found is that it does bring together those those uh, those benefits like greater well-being and better engagement with one's life, helping people to have a greater sense of purpose and meaning, and these kinds of things, which you know most mindfulness programs are gonna gonna bring forth. You know, I think obvious an obvious contribution of mindfulness-based strengths practice is gonna be the the character strengths element. So it's gonna be the the element of helping people to know more about who they are. So it's going to be this link with positive identity. So that's going to be something that's going to be, be pretty strong with the MBSP. Uh, there's going to be this aspect of greater strengths use and being more savvy with how we use our character strengths, that we can be mindful with how we apply our strengths in our daily life and whether we, you know, to manage not using too much or too little of a strength in a particular situation. So there's these kinds of benefits. And then I would also mention um, there, there's kind of two standout benefits. And I'm not saying that MBSP is the only thing on the planet that, that creates these benefits, but I think they're pretty novel and, and good contributions of MBSP. And we'll see if the research you know, continues to bear this out, but I've noticed this in the many different groups and in what other people have um, reported. And that is that MBSP seems to be particularly good at helping people to improve positive relationships. Uh, as is one, and the other is managing problems. And so I'll, I'll talk about each briefly. So the so the positive relationships uh, benefit is this aspect of when we're bringing forth our best qualities, our strengths, and we're bringing it in where we're bringing that careful awareness and attention to it in our life. There seems to be this benefit where we then care and tune in more to other people, and we begin to create stronger connections with them. You know, we begin to be a little bit more fair, a little bit more forgiving, and, you know, we begin to use these ingredients that actually nurture positive relationships. And we're doing it by literally tapping into those ingredients, character strengths, and using mindfulness as a support, as a, as a tool for doing that. Um, so that's one. And I mean, I could tell you stories about how, you know, it's uh, like one, I remember one guy in an MBSP program, this was about week six or so, and I was asking people what, you know, what are your findings so far in, in this experience? And he raised his hand and he shared with the group that he had been estranged, estranged, so hadn't been in communication with his son for 15 or 20 years. And that this mindfulness-based strength practice program got him to realize, gosh, I have these incredible strengths within me of fairness and kindness and social intelligence, but yet I'm not using them very well in my life. I mean, maybe I'm using them a little bit at work and I'm doing some good with projects, but I'm not using them with where it matters so much, which is my own family, my son. And yeah, there's reasons why my son and I have been disconnected and so on, but 
you know, but that's not how I want my life to be. I, and so this man then said that he, because of the program, because he was cultivating strengths and mindfulness, he began to reconnect with his son. And he reached out to him, and now they have a, a regular communication. You know, they began to email um, um, uh, every other day or so and talking on the phone about once a week. So pretty dramatic change from not talking for 15 to 20 years. Um, so there's in, in when I ask people after they complete MBSP and when people ask people in those other cultures, what are your experiences when you complete MBSP? Uh, do you find that there was any benefit to to one of your relationships? Did this program cause that? Uh, and pe most people, not everybody, but most people say yes, and then they can give an, a, a specific example of how one of their relationships improved. Maybe they became a more mindful listener with their spouse. Maybe they uh, connected better with a work colleague or their boss. Maybe they established some new friendships. But there seems to be that, uh, that powerful benefit. And then the other side is there seems to be a good benefit with managing problems. So helping people to really to reframe problems. You know, we can get locked into problems and get lost within problems and difficulties and psychological and physical disorders, and we can begin to get so lost that that's all we see. But then we, if we have tools like mindfulness and character strengths, it helps us to step out and to move out of that prison that our problems can create for us, and we begin to see them in a different way. And character strengths provide that lens or that language for reframing problems. And we begin to, to see other people in a different way and see ourselves in a different way. So I think the, the program helps with that end of things as well. I also found in my research, which had absolutely nothing to do with your work, that I was looking at character, well, basically strengths use in daily life. And yeah. the most, I mean, people are very different, and I did a qualitative study, so it's not, you know, something that I can generalize or anything, but the the one thing that people seem to have in common who struggled was that they were not able to step out of you know basically their stream of consciousness to even remember or to to remember to use their character strengths so mm. when you when i you know around that time i heard about your book and your work and and i just thought this is so interesting and it, it actually mindfulness i feel like in it enables um the use of character strengths and i think you know i'm excited about this work for different reasons and it's not you know just, I mean, that would be enough. It would be interesting enough to kind of say you're combining it, mindfulness and character strengths. But what excites me even more is that I feel that actually in a weird way, we have sold, you know, strengths and stuff a little bit short because we're portraying it as this, you know, do this intervention for a week or two and then you're fine. And I just always felt like, no, it's a way of life. And the mm. biggest benefits, the most transformative effects, they happen when we kind of integrate the different concepts in psychology. And you've done this beautifully. And and that's just, you know, something that I feel we kind of need to go into looking at, all right, maybe it's not just a question of do strengths, you know, does this intervention work? It's more like, all right, how can we create the kind of conditions for different people? What concepts need to be combined? So I feel like you have, you have, I don't know, pioneered a lot of things doing this, I feel at least. And similar with what you did with movies, you know, I was similarly excited about that. So I hope others will follow your lead, honestly. Well, thank you. And I think, I mean, it's really well said about the, the aspect with, with character strengths and mindfulness that these really are ongoing processes and experiences within us that we can cultivate. And yeah, there might be some immediate initial benefit if people do an exercise or intervention that's mindfulness or strengths, you know, alone. But, but yeah, there seems to be, it, very, it seems to be particularly important for people to kind of keep it as a mindset that they just can inhabit for the rest of their life. And in, re in keeping a humility to it that, that we never really fully get it. So it, like you said, it isn't just do it for two weeks and then that's kind of it. But it's something like, you know, I'll do it for those couple of weeks, but then keep going for the rest of my life that this is just going to be incorporated in. Just, just like I need to get movement in my daily life you know, or exercise movement. I need to eat, you know, fairly well, you know, for the rest of my life. Maybe not perfectly, but fairly well. You know, we need to to, to bring a sense of mindfulness and character strengths. Not perfectly, but, you know, fairly well. Uh, if, you know, to really uh, have a, a life of flourishing and uh, where we can manage things in a, in a fairly uh, 
savvy way with good equanimity and, and so on. Okay, so last question. What can a listener do right now to take a step towards improving their mindfulness? You know, I think that the first step actually is a phrase that I sometimes call catch AP ASAP. Uh, and that stands for catch your autopilot as soon as possible. Catch your autopilot as soon as possible. You know, and that that's the start of mindfulness. And that anybody can do it literally this second as we're talking, and then can do it as soon as we're done talking, and then can do it for the rest of their life and it's a lifelong journey and what it means is that is first we have to really almost be humble to the fact that our minds so easily go off into autopilot you know we do have stream of consciousnesses we do have pathways of thinking where we can be thinking of 10 things at once and we do process huge amounts of information in in seconds that we're not even aware of so there's so much going on in our mind so our minds quickly go off in autopilot and they think about different things and they drive us in different directions and we often don't even know that that's happening and so a, a key first step is just to be aware of our thinking that way and to be aware that gosh I do go off into autopilot and that and that's totally normal that's what all minds do even the the, the most brilliant of mindfulness minds if it's the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh and others you know, their minds go off in autopilot too. You know, even, you know, they might be particularly good at bringing it back and they may be pretty good at managing it, you know, because of all their practice, but it's just a normal part of human nature. So the idea is if we want to practice moving toward mindfulness in some way, then the idea is we got to catch our automatic pilot and we catch it, you know, as soon as possible. And as soon as possible because then we take a little bit more control of our life and we can say, okay, do I actually want to keep keep off in autopilot because sometimes we might we want to we want to keep keep going in autopilot and, and just maybe it spurs some creativity because autopilot is sometimes good it helps us to kind of decompress it helps us to be creative sometimes um, and so we can but it, but it's better when we're making that decision it's where we say you know I want to go in autopilot on purpose um, rather than our minds just always doing it and we don't even know that we're gone half the time so that would be my suggestion is catch your autopilot as soon as possible, whether you're with your children, with your significant other, with a friend, washing dishes, walking in the park, working hard uh, at your computer or at a team meeting. Catch your autopilot as soon as possible. And, and then step two might be, in, in, and you might come back to the present moment if, if that suits you in that particular situation. Okay, so where can listeners find more find out more about you about me um, well they could go to you know there's a couple of different sites I mean you know there's certainly the via character site so www.viacharacter.org um, which isn't so much about me I mean I'm listed on there um, but it's more about character strengths. You know, I, there is my own website, which I haven't really done much to maintain, but there is a ryannemick.com website that has a little bit more info on me and uh, a lot of free articles that people can, can upload and um, some information there. So that's just the spelling of my name, ryannemick.com. Um, and of course, I would encourage people, if they're interested in these topics, to, to get the Mindfulness and Character Strengths book, which you can easily get on Amazon. It comes with a, uh, a CD. Uh, of meditations on mindfulness and character strengths and uh, people can get it uh, in an, uh, a Kindle version and then get those uh, files as MP4 files so kind of different resources like that. And I guess the final thing I would say in terms of me is I, I do a blog on psychology today. Um, the name of the blog itself is called What Matters Most? Question mark. What Matters Most? And um, and so I try to write about once a week uh, an article on mindfulness and character strengths or some other positive psychology topic in a user-friendly way that also has some research bent to it uh, or reflects the research. Um, so that's kind of another, another resource for people. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Ryan. My pleasure, Kristen. Thank Always you. great to talk to you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, you can help us out by sharing it with your network and leaving a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher. We would love to hear from you at kristen at strengthphoenix.com. For show notes and more, 
head over to www.strengthsphoenix.com. Thanks for listening to the Positive Psychology Podcast. We're saying goodbye with Happy Yogurt. <laughs>